So I kind of feel like I grew up with Brian Beitler because we started working together when I was a teen. Um, actually, I was at 17. I wasn't really a teen. Um, but Brian was the CMO of David's Bridal, where we worked on a prom program together. And from there, Brian became the EVP CMO of Lane Bryant, where O was part of the Omno um, Angel campaign. And now Brian is the EVP, Chief Marketing and Brand Development Officer of J. Jill. We all have very long titles now, right? It's crazy. Um, where Hearst titles, Oprah and Food Network, are part of the Inspired Women series. So in his free time, Brian is the chairman of the executive board of the Global Retail Marketing Association. And I'm sure in his free time, he also gives a lot of fashion advice to his six children and wife. You're a very brave man, Brian. <laughs> very brave. And Brian has always believed that your customers hold the key to your success, combining the insights gleaned from customers and mixing that with data science to inform great advertising and marketing and innovation for the brands that he has overseen in his career. His creativity has been recognized actually in just about every position that he's held with accolades, both in terms of creative awards and increased sales. At J. Jill, Brian wanted to engage in an authentic way with real women to hear where they get their inspiration. And that's where Food Network and Oprah come in as we both re reach inspired women who want to live with joy, passion, and purpose. Our powerhouse brands have been in the top 10 newsstand performers since their launch, collect, I mean, respectively, 10 years ago, and we're celebrating our 20th anniversary next year. So through J. Jill's research, they found that their customers are consumed with both cooking and reading as lifelong passions. So the synergy for all of us was really a match made in heaven. By way of an example, um, Oprah's Book Club, I'm sure you've heard of it, but Oprah is responsible for selling 80 million books in this country. And we know that long form journalism is a must for women to expand their horizons. So J. Jill capitalized on this by putting five women, I hope you saw them out there as you were getting your breakfast, but they were five authors that were highlighted in our summer reading series. And J. Jill put them in their advertising and uh, video on multiple platforms, in catalogs, and the in-store visual merchandising was fantastic. So what could be more authentic to include cover girls of a different sort? Remember, authors are on a cover, right? You see their picture. Um, and the authors, because obviously they're not generally called upon to be models, were beyond thrilled with the program. And for Food Network, the mega brand tapped into the philanthropy that J. Jill has focused on for almost 20 years, the J. Jill Compassion Fund. And this program helps disadvantaged and homeless women to gain self-sufficiency. And it was mixed creatively with the other passion point, which is cooking. So all of the women featured in the J. Jill um, Food Network program took their love of, for food into life-changing missions, from feeding the homeless right here in East Boston to training women to become future chefs. Uh, this fully integrated program included native content and an influencer event as well. So I want to, you met Vicki, but please, Vicki, stand up. This is my partner in crime, Vicki Wellington, who is the publisher of the Food Network magazine. Yay! <laughs> stop, stop. <laughs> bring it on, bring it on. Um, both Food Network are Thrill and, and Oprah, obviously, are thrilled to be a part of this collaboration. And we will certainly reach core consumers as well as new and prospective customers for J. Jill in a very real and authentic way. So, and thanks to J. Jill for recognizing that all women are not a size two and are not 22 years old. Um, your inclusionary brand really speaks to me and I happen to be modeling here today. <laughs> Available in the Burlington Mall. <laughs> Should you have some time later today, they're having a lovely sale. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Brian Beitler, who's going to share some insights from his most amazing career. Thank you. Come on up, Brian. Thank you. You're so kind. <laughs> 
So it's funny, you know, um, relationships matter, and I appreciate both Vicki and Jane being here and their teams and the support and Kathy and the Ad Club, who we've had a, a relationship for some time now. And, and, you know, it's interesting. At the end of the day, I think uh, life is about relationships, whether it's personal uh, or professional. And those that we establish uh, and cherish can nourish our life uh, for our entire life if, if we do so. And so. Um, I'm grateful to have people who I've had a relationship with there. I was there with the, at Kohl's actually with Food Network when they launched the brand uh, and had a chance to be a part of that amazing launch, had a chance to be a part of the OWN Network uh, at Kohl's when the OWN Network was launched, right? And then these relationships just continued to flourish. And like I said, I've known Jane since, you know, closely since 17 and the work that we did at David's, and we'll talk about that. And, and it's just, it's powerful. And I think about that in the context of, of family. So this is my family. We just got back from Spain uh, two days ago. Um, and I put them up here because I think about how decisions are made in families. And it's interesting, right, is uh, it's not this, uh, at least anymore, although thank you, me too, right, it's not this, <laughs> you know, uh, autocracy where, where, you know, the guy makes the decision, but it comes from conversations with everybody in the family. You develop these strong relationships and you ask people where they want to go on vacation, what they want to do, uh, and it helps to shape who and where you are. And as we talk about marketing, I want to talk about two people in my family, uh, one in this picture, one not in the picture. Uh, that has shaped a lot of how I think about my career and my life and the way that I've operated and about how I think about brands and marketing. And the first is my mother. Uh, and it, when I was, it was when I was a young boy and I used to play Little League Baseball. Um, and I was a pitcher. Uh, and I can remember being 10 years old. I was a, I was a lefty, which was a novelty uh, then, still now, and was you know, on the mound and pitching. And I, what I loved about that experience is my mother was the loudest person in the crowd. <laughs> I mean literally the loudest person in the, in the crowd. I carry some of that forward, my kids will tell you, and, and those who work with me as well. So, but she would cheer at the top of her lungs, and whenever I got up and I would pitch, she would root me on and, and, and tell me I was gonna do well, and when I would strike someone out, my mom would literally stand up and cheer, yeah, Brian, nice job, well done! And then as the batter walked away, she'd say, it's okay, you'll get him next time. <laughs> and then, as I would be up there pitching again, and I would throw the ball, and, and the batter would get a base hit, she, my wife, mother would stand up and say, yeah, good hit! Don't worry, Brian, you'll get him next time. <laughs> and this was an interesting observation, right? What my mother was, was she was a champion of winning, of winners, right? She always wanted me, my team, to win. But what she appreciated most was success on both sides. Right? And so it was crazy because I would have friends sometimes say, why does your mom cheer for the other team when they get a hit? And at 10, I didn't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, uh, I didn't understand it. But as, as I've grown, right, I've gained an appreciation for someone who recognizes that uh, looking and seeing success is what's important. And also admiring success and appreciating it when it happens, even when it's inside of your competition. Um, or inside of uh, another individual, inside another colleague getting promoted above you, um, or other experiences around you, right? And it was, it was a valuable lesson to le learn as a young boy, right, that the, the idea is not to beat somebody, but the idea is to appreciate excelling and winning wherever and however it happens. And that's been important to me across my career, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more. The second person in, uh, you know, in my life that's, that's added a lot of shape to my career is the woman in the middle in the sunglasses, uh, my wife, Amy. Um, I tell you that because she looks about as old as my daughter's, which yeah. is awesome. Like, genetics <laughs> has done her well. I, I hope to keep that. But um, anyway, you know, when we got married again young, so we got married at 19. Um, we had our first child by 21. We had three by 24, so we started kind of at, at full speed. Um, I was still in college, she was still in college, like there, there was a lot going on at that point in time. But it was interesting, we talked a lot about relationships at that time, and I can't remember whether it was in the first year or the second year of marriage, and you know, we were absolutely in love, and we were talking about, you know, how do we ensure that our relationship endures, right? How do we make sure that, that we don't become another statistic, right? And, and it happens where people do separate, and there's really good reason for that, but we sat out and said, we wanna, we wanna figure out how we do this for us. And it's interesting, and she said, well, I think the most important thing is that we realize that um, relationships aren't a 50-50 affair. Um, she says they're a 100-100 affair, right? She says it means I give 100% all the time to this relationship, you give 100% all the time to this relationship, and if we do that, it works. And you know, we had a conversation about that, and, and, and you know, 
for me, again, I was, I mean, men just don't think that way. Um, we just, I don't mean to be critical of us, but we just don't, right? And she realizes, well, and, and that means there are going to be some times where, where one of us is only giving 50 or 25% because relationships are hard. And what that means is the other one has to keep on at 100%, right, till the other one recovers. And I think about that in business, and I think about that in relationships um, with people you work with or companies that you work on, because part of this is figuring out, you know, how do we move forward? And so I'm grateful for the conversations that I've had in my personal life because of the way they've influenced how I think about both personal, professional, community involvement. Um, and it's, it's why I love experiences like this. So when I think about my professional career, so that's Robin uh, to my right facing this way, Barbara to my left. So Robin is a customer, Barbara is a store manager. Right? And so part of it, as I think about how do we lead and how to develop brands and how do I learn and how do I make decisions, again, it comes the same way. It comes from conversation. Right? It comes from engaging with people who are close to what you're close to. In this case, right, J. Jill. It's a brand that I've become close to. I tell people all the time I'm a hopeless romantic. I fall in love with my brands very quickly. Um, and I'm in love with the brand that I'm working on right now, J. Jill. Right? And so you want to spend time with other people who are close to it. And one of the best places to do that is inside of a store, right? because that's where you have a customer who's close to a brand, where it means something to you. And it's where you have a store leader who's close to a brand and working very hard to kind of drive and move that business forward, take care of her customers, make sure the brand is successful, make sure her store is successful, make sure her team is successful. right? And as you're trying to think about how do I learn about what I need to do, in order to drive a brand, you need to be able to have those conversations. So I'm going to take you on a journey and what I think is happening in marketing and how I think those of us who are involved, whether you're marketing your brand as Jane is, is doing or as Vicky is doing to build their publishing you know, empires and strength, or you're selling ads to guys like me, or you're a brand trying to develop ads, part of this is, is trying to get out of what I think has become, in some cases, um, and not to be overly critical, but just kind of mindless marketing. And it feels a lot to me like this. Um, nice little boy sitting on his dirt and casting his rod into the sea and waiting for something to bite, right? Without really any visibility or any conversation with the fishies to see what they're interested in, right? He knows because he has some experience. And it's funny because I look at a place like this and I go, that's what's underneath the sea. That's what it looks like to me. <laughs> Right, just a bunch of stuff cast out into the sea and hoping that one of the fishies swimming by bites, right, and takes a look at it. And it happens to me every day, and probably to you, like in an inbox. This will give you a little taste of the brands that I follow, right? So some of them are women's brands. I work in the women's industry, um, but you know, it just it just kind of fills in the you know the clutter. It just kind of keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and. And why do I have an interest in any of this? Or why should I have an interest in any of this? Right? It's this notion of you know, kind of this fisherman scenario where it's in, in brands or in, in marketing or in selling our business, whether we're trying to drive resume, we just kind of cast stuff out. And as I thought about that young and early in my career, I realized I didn't want to be that kind of a brand. Uh, and I didn't want to build those kind of brands. I wanted to build brands that looked like this, right? where I created something that people just wanted to be near me, right? That that was the intention, was to say, how do we set out to develop a brand that has ideas and creates connections that people want to draw themselves into or to get close to those, to those brands? And so you know, part of that is, is you know, we're going to talk a little bit about how do you have conversations, how have I had those conversations. Hopefully, some of it will be helpful to you, some of it may not. Um, and how do we create brand desire? You know, one of the things that's interesting for me is, um, you know, I hear a lot in my careers, and and I've moved, you know, as uh, Jane shared, I've moved from companies several several times, and one of the terms that's thrown around so often inside of a company that concerns me is the word differentiate or differentiation. We talk about how do we make our brand different? How do we make what we're doing different from somebody else? How do we drive? that so that people will see us that we're not like them. And it's interesting, because I look at them and I ask the question, but why? Like, why do you want to be different? And when I ask that question, oftentimes internally, I get back a blank stare. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, why do you want to be different? Well, because they're blue. 
if Walmart's blue, then I should be red. Like, I can't be blue if I'm Target because they're already blue and I need to be red. And then when I'm Amazon, I should be orange, right? And we, we pick colors, and I'm not trivializing those brands and what they've done because they're led by remarkable leaders. But the viewpoint is that sometimes we make decisions to be different. And it's not about being different. It's about being desired, right? And sometimes the best way to be desired is to do exactly what your competition is doing. Just do it better. And so as we think about that, right, and how do you do that? Well, you do that by spending time and getting close to, to, brand, to your customer and thinking about things that they might care about. Here are a couple of brands who I think have done that really, really well at finding a way to be desirable by putting a focus on things that they believe their customers might care about, right? So Tom's, I love this ad, right? The style is basic. The mission is extraordinary. Right? That's a reason to be part, and they tell you the story, which they sing you their song, right? The same way a rock star would, right? I love this brand, um, Airbnb, and what they've done, right? They take the notion of travel, right? Live there even if it's just for a night, right? And they take this notion of Instagram and this notion of, of social currency that has evolved over the course of the last decade and how important social currency is, whether you're 16 or whether you're 60. And they've said, look, social currency, we understand it, and we're going to help you uh, with that social currency. And then this other brand, I, I love this. You can't read this, so I'll read this to you. This is Warby Parker, right? It says, our glasses break just as easily as those expensive designer glasses. That's because our glasses are made alongside the expensive ones. So the only difference between our glasses and theirs, the price, right? So again, recognizing our connection or our desire, right? To, to have style as a part of our life and that, we, and that there's, a, there's a group of consumers that care about that, but then putting it in a context, right, that's powerful for you thinking about, oh, this is why I want to be part of their brand. But this isn't about being different from Pearl Vision. This is about creating a reason for why you want to be a part of, you want to be a part of the brand. And so I'll tell you stories about some of my experiences over, over my career, uh, and then we'll talk about J. Jill as well and the work that, that we're trying to put in place and the, and the team there that we have that's trying to think about how do we have these connections with our brands. Um, but I want to start with this, and we talked a little bit about, about Kohl's, and it, it, interesting in terms of understanding connectivity and, and how and where do you find the things that people care about. And you have to flash back. So I was there in 2007, um, just as we were entering the recession. Great year to join. Um, <laughs> just as the financial crisis is starting for everybody in the country, and you know your mission is to grow through all that, through all that crisis, right? Um, and it was interesting because we were trying to engage and, and learn and understand, you know, how do we better connect with customers, Kohl's, um, do we have Kohl's customers here? A few of you? A few of us in the, in the, in the, in the room. So, um, all right, high, low brand. Uh, they use promotional discounting very a, a lot. And in their case, I love it because it's a part of the DNA of the brand and a part of the DNA of the customer. And they understand what's, what's, uh, what's important to the customer. But at the time, we were trying to figure out how do we, how do we take this deep connection that this consumer has to being able to mag you know, take her dollar and make her dollar go as far as possible, particularly as we were entering the recession, right? And this was 2008 by the time we're, we're, we're doing some of this thinking. And it was funny, I was in a store. I was actually not in a store. I was actually on my way home, um, and I, I had to pick up. It was a Friday afternoon, and we were having a barbecue, so I stopped to pick up some steaks um, from the grocery store. So the grocery store on this corner, kitty corner across the intersection, of Kohl's on this this one. So I run in, I run to the back of the meat counter, I get my meat, I get to the front, I pay for it, I got like $80 of meat, and they ask me if I have my little card, and I do, and I give it to them, and I save like $1.20. And the, the lady goes nuts. She's like, you saved $1.20, and she circles. I don't know if any of you remember this with club cards when they first got started not that long ago, right? And they, they circled the, the savings, like, you saved $1.20 on $80 of meat. And she was very excited. Um, and so I bought the meat and I went across. Well, I was on my way home and we had just started, I think, carrying, I think it was Godiva chocolates. And I thought, well, well, I'll stop by the store. I had to run through anyway. It was, a, it was a floor set we had done. We just reset the floor. And so I run through, uh, I do the walk through the store, look at all our visuals, everything that we put up. And, and on the way out, I stop. I think I'm going to pick up these chocolates. And I, so I go get in line and I'm standing behind a woman and she's just finishing checking out. And as she finishes checking out, she freaks out. She's like, this is amazing. This is so crazy. I just saved $200. And I'm like, what? <laughs> And she's very excited, like, and she's excited. And I'm like, how do you know that? So I stop and I introduce myself. I say, hi, I'm Brian. I, you know, I work uh, in marketing at Kohl's. I said, you're very excited about all the money. So I says, how do you know you say that? And she had a specific number, like $202.20. I'm like, how do you know that? And she's like, oh, I'm really good at math. Because our receipts at the time didn't even subtotal the savings. 
right? So this is a high-low brand where we have a retail price, and then we have your 50 off night owls and early birds, and then we give you a Kohl's charge discount, and then we give you some Kohl's cash back, right? And so she had done the math in her head, right, on her big long ticket, and she looks at us and goes, I saved more than I spent. Now, if some of you know, that became a part of our marketing campaign. <laughs> that was a customer's words, right, who said, I saved more than I spent. So I saved $1.20, and we didn't even circle the savings, <laughs> right? So as we were looking for a way to figure out how do you drive a brand connection that's deep, and this one's right around value, it's all about promotion, but it can be electric to the customer because it's the reason she's trying to connect with your, with your brand. Right? And so we took this very cheesy idea. By the way, if you still go to Kohl's today, you still see the circle of your savings, right? It's still digital, right, on the screen now in, in, in front of you. This we had to buy, yeah, I, I don't even know how many red pens, like 10,000 red pens, and we sent 10,000 red pens to the store, right, so that we could capture this moment of going, look, how do we get the brand to feel connected, right, to the customer, to something that she cares about, right? And part of it came by saying, listen, how do I listen to how do I listen to her? And here I was in, in, a, in, a, in a store, right, and that conversation kind of presented itself uh, right in front of me. And then we went back, and, and, a, and an amazing team of people helped to activate, right, and to be able to tell, you know, that, that story. And so, you know, a powerful way for us to change, and you saw the more you know, the more you coals, and, and a bunch of campaign work uh, driven by a lot of intelligent people coming out of insights like this from having a conversation, you know, with the customer. Um, David's, which Jane mentioned, we did some amazing work there. In fact, one of my, a uh, uh, little sidebar, one of the, my, the most creative and favorite relationships I ever had was Seventeen Magazine, and, and what we did there was we literally had high school girls design prom dresses. Um, and the high school girls submitted the prom dresses. Uh, we then allowed a team at Seventeen to kind of narrow those dresses down for us, and then uh, we let the team, we let teens vote on which dress would be made. And we did this in like a six-month period, so it went from full stop, and then we sold that dress based on um, Van Gogh's Starry Night was the inspiration behind the, the young girl's dress. Uh, we put it online, and it sold out in literally less than a week, oh right? And so, but again, that creativity came from a partner. That wasn't, you know, we just said, look, we want to figure out a way to activate and connect with, with, with a customer. But anyway, I'll tell you another story about this brand. So, um, you know, part of what we are trying to figure out here is, again, how do we create deep connections? And now, David's, if you know the brand at all, uh, if you're female or, or if you've been in that store, it's not conducive to the dream uh, wedding experience. And I don't say that to be critical of the brand at all, but um, it's a value-oriented brand. Uh, we have, in some stores, 30 fitting rooms, right? So it's not this intimate boutique setting that you saw in all of the wedding movies when you were growing up, right? But it serves a very valuable purpose because you still want a dream dress, but how, how, do I make that, how do I make that moment special, right, for you? Or how do, and we understood that. We'd done enough work to realize, look, all a, any bride wants is that moment of celebration, that moment of finding the one and feeling like this whole universe is focused around her. Um, and we were struggling to figure out how to, to create that. At the same time, we were looking at stores that had incredible growth, right? Thinking that there might be some secrets inside of those brands or stores that had amazing growth. And that might be where we would find some insight that would help us deepen a connection to the customer. And so I was traveling uh, stores. We actually had a team traveling stores. I was fortunate enough uh, that I had a store that was just, we were relocating from Wisconsin, which is where Kohl's was, to David's, which was in Philadelphia. I had a store in Madison just down the road uh, from us. So I was there um, as a home weekend because we, we were getting ready to have our sixth child, I think, at that time. Um, and I drove over. We had a very good performing store in Madison, Wisconsin, run by a woman named Erin. And you know, we went over to the store to meet with Erin and to have a conversation with her. So I was in the store. I got there in the morning, 10 o'clock. I think it was a Thursday morning. Um, stores open at 11 uh, for Dave. not a lot of brides out shopping on Tuesday at you know, 8 a.m. in the morning. And as we were in there, right, she had a conversion rate which, which was just above and beyond anybody else's in the company. And we couldn't figure out exactly what was going on. So we wanted to try and understand in that store. And I get in the store with Erin, and I ask her, and she says all the things that, that store managers, good store leaders tell you. They tell you how well they, they execute against the operational disciplines of the company. They talk about the importance of being focused on the customer. They talk about hiring a really good team. But that's true in a lot of places. But there was something else there, and we didn't know what it was. Well, as fortune would happen, about noontime, we'd been talking for a couple of hours, uh, and a bride runs in. She's dressed head to toe in nurse's scrubs. Um, and she says, I've got 30 minutes to find my wedding dress, <laughs> which is also atypical. Yeah, very much so. So um, our 
uh, reception at the front of the store says, we'll get you set up with a consultant and we'll start the process. And you know, as they're walking back, you know, Aaron and I are kind of following and we're listening to this little dialogue um, that's happening. You know, she's telling how you know, she's just looking for something simple, something short, something sweet. And so the consultant and her go to work and we're waiting and we're watching. Um, and about 25 minutes in, she comes out and she's got it. This is her dress. She's found her dress. So six, five or six dresses in. And so as that begins to happen, we go back to the back to kind of celebrate her with like she, she had found her dress in uh, kind of un unbelievably short amount of time. Um, and as we get there, um, Aaron stops the bride uh, with a consultant because the bride's about to run back in, change, get back into her nurse scrubs. So I presume to go back to work. I, I mean, that's my guess is this, is this is a lunch break. And Aaron looks at her and says, um, wait, um, uh, I'll be right back. And Aaron runs around the corner. She comes back, and she's got this bell in her hand. And um, she says, we have a little uh, tradition in, in our store. When you find the dress of your dreams, uh, we ask you to ring this bell and make a wish. And the bride looks at her and says, oh, no, 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 you don't, you don't understand. I appreciate that, but I, I'm in a hurry. And, and they're bantering for a minute. She says, no, you just really try. She says, no, you don't understand. She says, I'm 48 years old. This is a second marriage. We're getting married at City Hall. It's not that big of a deal, but thank you very much. Um, and Aaron says, please, will you? And so a little more banter, Aaron finally wins. <laughs> and the bride says, fine, give me the bell. <laughs> bride takes the bell. Says, what am I supposed to do? Aaron says, wait. Aaron runs around the corner, comes back, has a veil, puts a veil in her hair. And then says, OK, here's what I want you to do. She says, I just want you to turn around, face the mirror. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to think about the new life that you and your husband are about to begin together. And I want you to take the bell. I want you to make that wish. And I want you to ring the bell. Right? And so bride closes her eyes, right? makes her wish, rings the bell, and opens her eyes. Right, and she's overcome with emotion. Right, totally, totally overcome with emotion. Um, and then Aaron's overcome with emotion, and then our consultant's overcome with emotion, and then I'm crying, right? And so, you know, we're having this moment. So anyway, we finish this little moment, we all hug, we, we all do this thing. Yeah, some of you might be getting teary now, it's fine, I did it all the time. I've told the story enough that I don't get teary anymore, but, but I did for like the first hundred times I told it, um, right? And at the end of the day, right, she walks out, and as, as she's leaving, I go, oh my gosh. I'm like, do you do that for every dress? And Aaron's like, well, yeah. I'm like, you know, we want our way to celebrate. She says, what happens on a Saturday? And Aaron's eyes light up, and she goes, oh, it's the most amazing thing. Like, because when we ring the bell, like the whole store stops, right? And so what she'd done is she'd found a way to take this very big environment and focus all the light on a single bride, right? So those powerful stories you see in the store, so what did we do? We took that back, we rolled it out nationwide, right? Conversion went up, the sales got better, right? We sold the company later, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the story, right? That's the, that's the quick end of the story. And, and, and you're right, at the end of the day, it's not that easy, right? We did launch Vera Wang, and we did a lot of things with Zach Posen and Oprah, so there's a lot more to it than that. It's not that simple. Um, as I said, sometimes a little more complex than that, as was in the, uh, the, the opening advertisement for this conversation. But the point was, is right, there was this very powerful idea around recognizing, hey, here's a core attribute that this bride needs. She's in an environment that doesn't give it to her because of the nature of her financial constraints. She can't go have a Kleinfeld's experience, right? She, like every other bride, is watching Say Yes to the Dress. How do you make that moment happen? Well, you have to get close, and you have to listen, and you have to observe what's happening to the customer to gain that perspective. And when you do, you just get magical moments, right? You just get unbelievable magical moments. And so it's interesting. So, uh, you know, Jane referenced this as well. As, as you know, we moved to Lane Bryant, we thought about, you know, the same, the same conversation, the same piece, and how do you build a brand, you know, identity as, as we moved on. The same process. So as I, as I joined Lane, we traveled all the stores. Uh, I spent about six weeks in the market because I did not know. Um, I knew a lot of customers, and, and most of my customers have been, have been female throughout my entire career, uh, but I'd never been a part of a Plus apparel brand. Uh, I didn't know, um, you know what was important, so I spent a lot of time in the stores. And what was interesting there was, you know, as we talked to customer after customer, one theme kept coming up, which was um, we're ignored. Um, you know, with the exception of you and a couple of other places, nobody, you know, feels that, that we need or want fashion, right? There wasn't a lot of interest in fashion. Um, nobody celebrates uh, who we are at the time. So all you have to do, you have to run back. Now, we've come a long way, right? So Ashley Graham, as a cover girl, right, we're in a very different place. Ashley Graham got her modeling start with Lane Bryant some 20 years ago, um, right? And so at the, at the end of the day, um, 
Today feels very different, but if I just can rewind, before Me Too, before body positivity, that was just, guys, that was just four years ago. Four years ago, you couldn't open a magazine and see a plus body anywhere. And so, you know, part of this is, is they were just asking to be seen and to be celebrated. And it was so interesting. We were looking for ways to do that. And part of the, part of the insight there came from we have to do something because there's always been advertising for women with plus apparel. It showed up in, mag in, in catalogs. It showed up on occasion in television ads. But nobody was really, was really taking notice. And it was interesting. When we tried to explain the concept of saying, look, we want to we wanna celebrate you in a way that's very, very different. And we showed it to customers. So I was a little nervous. We were a little nervous. Linda Heasley was the CEO, same CEO with me here at J. Jill. Um, uh, she brought me here, and she brought me there. And you know, we were having this conversation. And it was, we, we, didn't, we didn't know how even the customer would respond. But we thought she would be excited. But when we tried to show Swipe, right? we tried to do a focus group. We tried to bring customers together and show them. They actually rejected the idea. And the reason was is because we didn't have any photography that looked like this. We had catalog-related flyer, but no, nobody had ever done an advertising campaign. So I was stealing swipe from, from folks. Well, and all that swipe was of what? They were of skinny women, right, in lingerie. Like, there was nothing like this. And it was so funny. We were, we were at the tail end of a focus group. I actually came out. So I'd been sitting there behind the glass. I actually came out from behind the glass. Like, I was so frustrated. I, like, did all the things that you're not supposed to do in the Cardinal Center of Research. Like, I knocked on the door. I said, look, I want to come in. I'm going to tell them who I am, and I want to talk to them. And so I went and I sat down, right, and there are eight women sitting around the table, and I said, I'm just so curious because, and I told them about my experiences in the stores and the conversation I'd had with both confident women and women who were more insecure, and both of them shared this desire to be seen, this desire to be celebrated, and yet we were showing them this idea that we thought would be good. We didn't know how good it was going to be. We just thought it would be good, and we couldn't, we couldn't get them through. And it was funny. There was, there was a woman sitting at the... Um, I just lost her name, but she was sitting at the far left hand end of the table, and she, she said, wait. She says, you mean you're going to take my body and you're going to shoot it like Victoria's Secret? And I said, yes. And he says, oh, well, that's genius. We just thought you were going to shoot skinny people and put Lane Bryant on. I mean, literally, it was such a foreign idea that she couldn't imagine this. What do meet my girls? One word. <laughs> Sexy. Sexy. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> how boring would it be if we were all the same? It's all about how you feel. I think it's in my eyes. It's something that looks like this. <laughs> Beautiful. I mean, honey, have you seen all this? Hot. Whoa. I'm no angel. I'm no angel. I'm no, I'm angel. no angel. angel. I'm all kinds of sexy. Kasik, exclusively from Lane Bryant. This is how I met the ad club, by the way, as a function of sharing this story, right? But as we did this and told the story, right, it blew up in a way that we just never expected. So we, we had an insight because we'd had conversations and we understood her. And when you did it, then the story just kind of exploded. And social media goes all over the place. Um, you know, and again, again, this is, so this is the April issue of Vogue. So those were the only plus size bodies in the September issues, all of them from a fashion magazine perspective. The board was a little mad that I didn't put our brand on there. Right? No branding. Right? Just a message to start a conversation, right, that would help to drive um, where we're going. And, but what was interesting is com as we started to tell the conversation, right, this is where listening, sometimes it's about listening to your partners um, in, order to, in order to have ideas. And I got up here, and I was, we were at one of Ad Cub's big events. And I totally bashed on their sponsor, Time Inc., um, or one particular one, uh, which was um, uh, which was Sports Illustrated, because one of the other brands had done a deal with them. And sitting like at the front table, just in front of me, is like the entire Sports Illustrated team, <laughs> as I'm tearing down the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue because it misrepresents women in all the wrong ways, right? But at the end of the day, building building brands is about having conversations and about listening. You know, it's funny I say that the art of storytelling is dead because it's been replaced by the art of conversation, right? And at the end of the day, right, it used to be I just broadcast my story. But today, it's really about can you engage in a narrative. And in this case, I got a narrative from a guy named Brendan Ritt, who happened to be the publisher. And he sent me a note. He said, Olive Branch, question mark. And what a powerful salvo from, from him, from what I had just done, right? He says, my name's Brendan, and I'm the publisher of Sports Illustrated. I heard our SI brand took it pretty hard on the chin at the Boston Ad Club event last week. 
if okay with you, I'd like to come to your offices and talk about a way we could help. Your ad dollars extend beyond the norm. Good chief revenue officer, right? <laughs> Finding a pathway, pathway forward after bashing his brand. And what happened next was that. Ashley Graham on the cover of Sports Illustrated and a female brand sponsoring Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition for the first time ever, right? So the point of building brands is, are you having narratives with your conversations, with your partners, with your people? Are you open? Are you listening to the ideas you know, that are possible? So I'll move. That's what we're trying to do here at J. Joe. Right? It's the same thing. It's having conversations with Brenda and Lisa and with Mary, right? trying to figure out what can we do? What do we hear from our customer right? that's not being given to them in the marketplace today? And it's interesting. And, and I saw on a sign here at the risk of, of getting in trouble with another brand, Google. <laughs> but I saw, I saw on the sign as you walk in, as you walk out this door, if you, if you look to your left, on there is a wall that says, we reach more 18 to 34-year-olds than any cable news network. Isn't that interesting? They're worried about an 18 to 34-year-old demographic. Guess who has all the money in this country? <laughs> They're 50-year-old women. Right? That's where the power and the influence of commerce is today. Yet the focus, because we're a youth-enthralled society, the same way we were a male-enthralled society, the same way we were a skinny-enthralled society, still exists. We still have pockets that we have to break through in terms of the way we think about equality and the way we think about interest. And it's interesting. Women here, they're, they're, I, won't, I won't show it because it's even in, in, in any company, um, but I, I, um, there was a great um, little super, I think, I don't remember if it was Amy Poehler, who did it about Hollywood age. Um, and if you haven't seen it, just, just figure out. It's very inappropriate. It's got Juliana Lee's Dreyfus in it. Um, but it's, it, it just talks about what happens as we age in the country, in, it, in this case specifically inside of Hollywood, but it's relevant, right? We lose focus. And so what's interesting is we talk to our customer. Now, here's the good news. Our customer is, is experienced. She's wise. She runs companies. She's raised families. She's been philanthropic. She's been involved in her community. Um, so unlike um, customers that I had at, at, at Lane who were saying, look, we want to be seen and we want to be celebrated, um, my customer isn't asking for that. In fact, she's beyond that. She's like. She's like, you should pay attention to me, but if you don't, I don't care. <laughs> like, I, like, I'm already here. I'm already successful. I've already accomplished uh, more than most of you have. But that doesn't mean, what we realized is that she wouldn't appreciate it if a brand just took a moment to kind of celebrate who she is and the energy. And our brand, you know, in part had an opportunity to do more of that. So part of what we're trying to do, and I'll show you a little bit of that, is just celebrate a little bit of what's happening there and changing this brand from, from being you know, what was developed as a catalog company and focused on, look, we dress you because you want to be comfortable, which is very true, um, but a brand that recognizes that comfort comes with a woman who's vibrant and full of life and reflects life and what's happened in life.
think as we talk to customers, it's just there's we're just inspired. Like there's so much that they share about what they've achieved and what they've accomplished in their life. I'm gonna look if I can just get half done half of what you've been able to achieve in your life, I'm gonna feel like I've lived I've lived fully. And so part of that is just being able to bring and celebrate some of that. And that's why we did the Oprah partnership. Uh, I'm gonna show you one more slide and then then we can just we can just talk about uh, about the brand. We're gonna go through this uh, and I'm gonna give you a sneak peek of what's happening um, with uh, our Food Network partnerships and just show you the video that what we're trying to do and, and celebrate just women who are doing amazing things in their life um, because candidly it's inspirational to us um, and inspirational to, to the women who are part of our brand. My name is Karen Rogers and I'm the founder and executive director of a nonprofit called Sprouts Cooking Club. The contrast of everyday fare of haves and have-nots is a real thing. And we at Sprouts want to include everyone. We truly believe that good food is for everyone. My name is Sandra Lorena Aleman Niger and I am the founder of the East Boston Community Soup Kitchen. When you walk into my soup kitchen, the policy is that you have to have an open mind and open heart, and there is no room for judgment towards anyone because in this space, everybody's the same. We're all human. Hello, my name is Lavanya Mahate, and I'm the owner of Saffron Valley Restaurants and the founder of Saffron Kitchen. Food is a universal language that everybody speaks, and oftentimes when refugees come over, one thing that they do bring with them is the food and their ability to share that food with the local people that integrates them into the community. My name is Valerie Segrest, and I'm a member of the Muckleshoot Tribe, and I work as a native foods nutritionist and the coordinator of food sovereignty efforts for my community. We're all humans and we all rely on food to exist in this world. And so it can shape the social fabric of people. And that's what feeding the spirit is really all about. The service I provide to our community is food. It's through food bringing people together, bringing different cultures, uh, different um, backgrounds, so through food, we get to know each other and we get to share about each other. I'm really inspired emotionally and intellectually and creatively by the foods, the land, the waters and the people of the lands that my ancestors dwelled on for thousands of years. And in such ways, they were able to create abundance and generosity for those to come in the future. For me, food is hope. Food is family, and that's something we reinforce in every cooking class that we give. I'm very humbled when somebody finds me inspiring and I, I take it upon myself to pay it forward and uh, um, you know, to inspire other people, but also um, to know that someone else has inspired me to do what I'm doing today. Right, so those are our women, that's what they do. Right, that's, that's the life that they live. And we realize in whatever capacity, right, as we watch all these customers come across the threshold, it's about being respectful of, of women who really are at the pinnacle of changing so much of, what, uh, of what's happened in society. And it's, it's funny, I think about, it's an honor for me, right, to step back and to be in a brand where the customer that I serve is a woman who's broken a grass ceiling, right? It's a woman who stood up and said, no, things have to change. Right? It's a woman that's taken time to help teach a younger generation that tomorrow can be better than today. Like, what an amazing customer for us to get to serve at Jay Jill. And our goal is to say, look, how do we give her apparel that honors right, the person that she is, right, that reflects the youthfulness and vibrance to still change and still drive forward change in this world. Right? And it's thinking about how, as a brand, do you gain that kind of insight and then put that insight into action? Like I said, we can't do it without partners. I mean, these are food networks chefs, right? The authors you see in the videos you saw playing, those are authors that Oprah found. And, and we go to partners that we can trust that are putting the same kind of care and consideration into that. And it's remarkable. And I think about the associates, right? At the core of this, um, you know, Chris Gayton and Heather are sitting in this room, is they're at the core. Two people, two talent inside this team driving forward this idea and going, you know, we have an idea on how we can take our respect to women and then reaching out to partners to help, you know, foster and make that happen. And that for me is what's powerful, right? It's that internal understanding, you know, it's, it's, it's 
sometimes frustrating for me, and I mean it sincerely, I get to stand on a stage and take credit for work that doesn't belong to me, right? And I get, I get accolades for things that, that really I have very little to do about. It's funny, Jane opened up with that comment about our long titles. <laughs> and it's funny, I had my, at the time, she was 18 years old daughter, her name's Michaela. I have Amanda here, who's my daughter, um, with a good friend, Claire, who's here with us this morning. Um, but I had Michaela, and she, was in, and she came and she interned in my office, and it was so funny. We, you know, we finished that, that week of, uh, or month of internship that she was there kind of in her high school career, uh, and she did some work for her teams, and it was funny. We were at home once sitting around the table, and she goes, now, tell me again, Dad, what really do they pay you for? <laughs> right? And it's because she had observed the work, right, and realized all I did was sit in a meeting all day, um, right, and here, and here I did. Um, but I wasn't generating um, those ideas. All the other ideas from the stories I told you, like, it's, it's unfortunate, right? They're not mine. I borrowed them from conversations, right, with customers um, or with associates or with partners, right? At the end of the day, it's about figuring out as a brand, how do you create desire? And you create desire, right, by finding the thing that your customer cares about the most and figuring out how you show them, you honor that, right? That you respect that thing that they care about. And then you craft your strategies, your media partnerships, everything around honoring that. And you don't worry a lot about your competition. I don't worry about my competition at all. I pay attention because my competition sometimes hits the ball out of the park. And I wanna take notice of that and go, is there something in that that my customer might respect, that my customer might honor, that I should bring into my brand? But I don't try and differentiate from my competitor. I don't care. I care about does my customer love what I'm trying to do and can I make what I'm trying to do better uh, today than it was yesterday and better tomorrow than it is today, right, at the end of the day. And that's how I think about building brands. It's how I think about shaping brands. It's how I think about living life, right? Can I live life better today than I lived it yesterday, live it better tomorrow than I lived it today? Right, and we're in a really good place. So I appreciate you spending some time with me and letting me kind of share a little bit of my stories and that. So thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to questions. <laughs>